the more objects you have in orbit, uh, the more likely you are to have collisions, to have accidents. And the whole point of space situational awareness, or SSA, is to keep track of everything in orbit. So we want to know the position of everything in orbit, its size, we want to know the orbit it's in. And this is a multi-billion dollar um, industry. It's really accomplished by a fleet of radar and optical telescopes. Um, this presentation today is going to focus on data from optical telescopes for two reasons. The first is the telescope we have at Georgia Tech is an optical telescope. And the second is that radar telescopes are somewhat limited in that they are extremely complex and expensive, and they take a huge amount of power to operate. Um, so optical telescopes are very common. So now I'm going to talk about the actual problem we want to solve, which is the angles only orbit determination problem. And specifically, it's an initial orbit determination problem. So if you take a look at the image on the right, uh, let's say, you know, you're someone sitting on the ground here and you take a picture of this star and we'll pretend that the star is a satellite. Now, if you're really good at recording your data, you can know where you are on Earth and you know the angle at which you took the picture. Uh, you can figure out uh, if you put this star in a spherical coordinate system, it's right ascension and declination, which are just two angles, right? The two angles in a spherical coordinate system. Uh, but no matter how hard you try, you are not going to know how far the image is that you took away from you. Um, it's just not possible with a single image. And the problem is optical telescopes return an image, and we need to know how far away the object is. So that's the motivation for this problem. That's called the angles-only orbit determination problem. And the question is, how do we find it? And the answer is traditionally what we do is we take a huge series of images. So we'll, we'll take you know, five minutes, three minutes, however many minutes of images. And we know the time associated with each image. So given the two angles and the time, we take a guess about what the model is, and we approach this as a numerical problem. Right? So we try and fit the data we've collected to a predetermined model. Um, you know, this approach works well in some cases, uh, but in other cases it doesn't. It just requires assumptions about the orbit, and crucially, it's computationally expensive. So you have to do this every single time you take the images, images of something, uh, and the computational intensity is the same every time. So that's our motivation for machine learning. Machine learning can really be thought of as the inverse of this traditional problem. So instead of taking a model we've pre-selected and trying to get the data to fit it, we do the opposite. We collect a huge amount of data, and we design a model to fit it. And then we can use that model on future data. Um, the benefits of machine learning is that it's really, really computationally cheap to evaluate a model, right? So it's very expensive to train it, but once you have your model, it's really easy to use, in contrast with traditional orbit determination methods, which can be computationally expensive. Uh, we chose a convolutional neural network as our architecture, um, and we selected it because it's really, really good at handling images. Um, and this is because convolutional neural networks can handle micro-scale patterns, right, which they do in these early convolutional layers. And then as they shrink the image, they also handle macro-scale patterns. So you really get kind of two views of the same image, image, or sometimes more, and it's very, very helpful. Lastly, we have to train using a huge amount of data. So we actually don't train using any real data. We use exclusively synthetic data. Uh, and the question that should come up is, why would we need to create any synthetic data? Because I began this talk by thanking GT Sort, because we have a space object research telescope. And the answer is that, uh, as amazing of a resource as it is, collection of real data is challenging, and opportunities are limited. Uh, they're limited by weather. They're limited by what satellites pass overhead. Uh, and crucially, they're limited by light pollution. So here is a map of light pollution in Georgia. Uh, white is the worst, and then, you know, blue and green are better. Uh, we are at the crosshairs right here. So the very worst possible place you could be for light pollution is right where we are, uh, and that poses some challenges. So what we do is we create synthetic data, which means we determine the satellite's position in the future, uh, and we create a plot out of it. So the question is, how do we do that? 
And we do that using what is called TLEs or two line elements. And those tell you about a satellite's orbit and its position in that orbit. And we propagate into the future using SGP4, which is a three degree of freedom propagation model and includes some of the perturbations we see in orbit. So it's got variations in Earth's oblateness, some solar and lunar gravity effects, a drag model for orbital decay. Um, it is not by any means the most accurate uh, propagator, but it is quick and we can use it to create a huge amount of data. So our goal is to generate, you know, these plots of images from many, many different orbits. And the fundamental question we ask is if I give the model, an image of an orbit, can it tell me what the orbit is? And the way we define the orbit is in these Keplerian orbital elements here, um, where E is the eccentricity, and that defines how circular an orbit is. A is the semi-major axis, that, defi that defines how big it is. The next three are angles that define its orientation, and the last is the true anomaly, which defines where you are in the orbit. Um, and the question that kind of comes to mind is why do we do this instead of using a state vector, right, which is just the position and the velocity? And the answer is we want a method that's robust to long observation. Uh, and what that means is for a very long observation, uh, all of these values in the state vector will change quite drastically, right? The position and the velocity will change a lot. Um, however, in a long observation, most of the Keplerian orbital elements will only change a little bit. A true anomaly will change a lot because it measures where we are in the orbit, but everything else just measures the orbital plane itself. So those should stay reasonably constant. So we can create a model that's robust to long observations, and we want to observe for a long time because it produces more data. So the next question is making a model location and epoch agnostic. And what that is is a fancy way of saying that we want to make a model that I can evaluate using data I collected in Atlanta, using data that someone collected in Guam or Chile or even on a space-based telescope. So it has to be independent of where the sensor is. And it also has to be independent of the time that the image was taken because it's not very useful if I develop a model that's not usable in a week, right? So what we do is we map to an inertial reference system. Uh, that's in quotes because obviously nothing is truly inertial, but the best we have is the International Celestial Reference System. And what that is is a reference system that is centered at the very center, so the center of mass of our solar system. And the directions are defined by extragalactic objects. So objects so far away that are outside of our galaxy. So for time scales we are concerned with, it is essentially inertial. That being said, we don't really want an axis centered at the very center. What we do is we transpose this axis to the geocenter, to the mass center of Earth, and we call it the geocentric celestial reference system. So it maintains the same directions, but a different center. Um, and that makes it more usable for satellites because the center of Earth is generally what they orbit about. Um, here you see a geocentric plot of the International Space Station orbit, and this is just shown to show you that you know you get your zero zero zero, so we're not offset by a huge amount. Next, we should ask how do we project two angles onto an image? So if you remember, I talked about how we have right ascension and declination, our two angles in our spherical coordinate system, uh, but we want to turn those into a two-dimensional image. And what that is essentially means is we are mapping a sphere to a plane. Uh, this is a, a field that's explored a lot by astrometry and also cartography. Um, and there's really two most common ways to do it. There are many, many others. The most common in astrometry is what's called a mole-wide projection, where you have right ascension on the x-axis, declination on the y-axis, and you introduce curvature into it and attempt to reduce the, dors the distortions. Um, in cartography, you'd use an equirectangular projection where, you know, you just have right ascension x-axis, declination y-axis, and we accept a large amount of distortion. Um, but both of them have distortion, and that's going to become important later. So we've talked a lot about how you would create synthetic data, but now it's important to talk about how you would 
evaluate a model using real data. And there's quite a few steps to it. The first is that if I take an image, I should know the center of the image, like purely because I know where I took it from and I know the direction I was pointing. Next, I want to look at the background stars. So the star field here, you can see a bunch of different stars. Um, and I should use this to determine the image orientation, which is, you know, how is the image orientate, right? Like, how is it rotated? Then I want to isolate the satellite location. So this is actually a GIF. There's a satellite passing by right here. This is real data we took. If you notice, the satellite is quite hard to spot. Um, so isolating the satellite location isn't super easy, but it's doable. Then we want to find the satellite coordinates, construct our plot, and pass it to the model. So this isn't only something we do with synthetic data. You can evaluate using real data, too. So we tried a whole bunch of different model architectures. We tried many, many different ones. And we eventually, uh, we eventually settled on the convolutional neural network. So we had 3D con three 2D convoluting layers and two maximum pooling layers and six dense layers. Um, and we optimized using Adam's optimizer with the loss function of mean squared error, which is you know, a very, very common set of parameters in machine learning. And we had a medium-sized test set, about 73,000 images, and, or training set, and then a test set of about 3,800. In this case, we used equirectangular projection, um, which may surprise you because it is the projection with more distortion. But so far, the model has actually performed better with it. And each satellite was propagated for about five minutes. So let's talk about how our model ended up performing. Uh, for each orbital element, uh, we're going to measure our performance using an R squared value. That's the coefficient of determination where one is perfect. So if we perfectly fit the data, it would be one. If we guessed the average of the data, it would be zero. So all of these orbital elements are actually really, really good. Um, these are R squared values that are, that are very impressive and very usable. But upon closer inspection, when we convert these positions, or when we convert the orbital elements into actual positions, they're too far off to be useful. So what that means is that we have errors in hundreds or sometimes even thousands of kilometers in our satellite initial position. And the question is, how can we have such high R squared values that so much error in our position? And the answer is that our model is really, really good at evaluating the kind of orbit a satellite is in. So is it low Earth orbit, you know, ME, is it middle Earth orbit, geosynchronous, Molnaya, sun synchronous, whatever. But it's really bad at within this regime, uh, defining the actual position of the satellite. So we track the trends of the data very well, but we don't track the very small trends of the data. And the question is, why does this happen? And there's really three explanations that are possible. The first is that the distortions due to mapping are just too high for the model to handle. Do you remember we talked about how right ascension declination mapping to a plane introduces distortions? Maybe those are just too big and the model can't overcome it. Second is that our mapping resolution could be too low. So at the end of the day, what we are feeding into our model are images, and they have a set resolution or a set size. Uh, and maybe the size is just too small. So maybe we need to try a bigger size. And lastly, the model may simply just be not complex enough. So it could be that you know these first two things aren't an error, aren't an error and the model architecture we've selected can come up with general positions just fine. They cannot understand the minutia of how orbits change. Um, so it could be really any one of these three. And that brings the discussion of future work. So it's a discussion of what is currently happening uh, and what we want to do in the long term. So three things are going on right now. Uh, the first is that we are increasing the mapping resolution, um, and that's running on pace right now as we speak. Uh, we're evaluating more kinds of mapping. So I talked about mole-wide and equirectangular. Uh, but there are many, many, many others, and we are investigating those too. And the last is that we want to ask, is the model more successful as a 1D convolutional neural network? And what that means is we are taking our right ascension and declination values and putting them onto an image. Uh, what if we never did that? What if we just fed the raw values to the algorithm? 
And how does it perform? Because then you avoid all the issues with distortion. And so far, the answer is it does not perform well, um, but we are hopefully going to change that. Longer term, there's really two big questions this kind of modeling approach has to answer. The first is, how do we want to handle a large range of observation duration, right? And in, it meant in that is, how do we encode how long the observation was into an image? The second question is, how do we handle discontinuous observation? So like I said earlier, there's a huge fleet of optical telescopes that are used to conduct space surveillance. So what happens is I see a sighting of an object in Atlanta, and then maybe in Chile, and then maybe in Guam or elsewhere. And how do we handle multiple sightings of the same object at discontinuous periods? And so those are the two long-term questions that have to be answered, and we are thinking about answers right now. And I'm free for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions to Rohan? Please type it in. <clears throat> At the same time, Sam, can you go ahead and set up your presentation? Of course. Yeah, I can see your part once now. So let's wait. Um, okay. Uh, Rohan, so there's the one question in the chat. Um, thank you, Daryl, for your question about um, what framework we use in PACE. So the framework we use is TensorFlow. Um, that is generally, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's right to say forced upon us, uh, but PACE is the most support for TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is what we uh, have tried. Um, the next ex uh, qu question, sorry, is about exploring Markov decision processes. Um, that is a great question. And no, we have not had a chance to explore Markov decision processes yet, um, but it is something we're looking into moving forward. So we, the types of models we covered are um, your standard linear regression, ridge regression. Um, we covered kernel transformation methods, so kernel ridge regression, uh, support vector machines. And then from there, we moved to Bayesian regression. And then after that, we tried a multilayer perceptron, fully connected networks, and that led us to the convolutional network, which is the one that performed the best. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now let's move to Sam's presentation. Um, so our next presentation is from Sam Wanderner. He is a third year undergraduate student in our school, and he has been working with Dr. Julian Rimaldi on the uh, on the Tensegrity rover research project for the past two years. Sam's interest includes space structures, and he will begin a graduate student at this fall. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Sun. As introduced, this presentation is going to talk about the development of that robotic Tensegrity rover. And what I'm going to go through today is basically the introduction to what is Tensegrity and how we're making that into the rover. And then I'm going to go into detail about the engineering efforts that were done to turn this rover into something of a reality over the last 12 months. All right, let's get into it with figuring out what exactly is Tensegrity. The term tensegrity, it's just a mashup of the words tensional integrity. And what does that mean? So a tensegrity structure consists of both tensile and compression members. What's unique about this is that those compression members, they're actually isolated from each other in the structure. They're not connected to each other. And they're isolated within this outer shell of continuous tensile cable elements. and this continuous tensile network is actually what provides that stability for those isolated compression elements within that tensegrity structure. So like I mentioned, these compression bars within the unit are isolated from each other. They aren't connected and they do not provide that stability. 
that job lies in the hands of those tension elements. So this is the thing that makes Tensegrity really unique. When you think of like a normal rigid structure, you can imagine the compression elements having a key role in the stability and integrity of that structure. And this brings me to buckling. So when we think of buckling on a common structure like say a truss or a column, we associate that buckling with failure. And if a bar buckles on a bridge or something, like that would be pretty catastrophic. And that's not the case with Tensegrity. On the right, I've got a stress strain curve plot that's kind of showing through buckling. And they're the two main regions of interest, the pre-buckling stage and then the post-buckling stage. So buckling is like when that line becomes horizontal. So most rigid structures, they want to remain in that sloped region before buckling because for them, buckling means failure. But tensegrity structures don't care. And these structures are able to take advantage of that full curve. And we can consider the area under the curve to be the elastic potential energy. And so with the tensegrity structures being able to use that full curve, we're able to store a lot of potential energy in our structure that we can use to jump and maneuver our rover. So before we dive deep into how the rover is constructed and how it moves, I want to take a moment and just talk about like what makes up the structure within each Tensegrity unit. So this project, we're mostly working with prototypes and as such, like all these materials are pretty easily accessible and we construct everything using hand tools uh, with the occasional help from the machine shop. There are three main components that make up this structural part of the Tensegrity units. The first one is the thin steel cables, which that's the tensile element that provides that stability shell. Then we also have our carbon fiber bars, which is the compression element. And then finally, we have a number of 3D printed nodes. These nodes, it's basically what connects the the bars and the cables together and that forms the structure and gives the tensegrity unit its shape in addition to all this we also have an actuator that we like to call a motor housing which hangs out within the unit and it's connected to those three printed nodes this is the device that will actuate and mechanically compress the unit to increase that elastic potential energy again this is like an ever-changing prototype and a lot of these components are 3D printed and they iterate and they change a lot. We make everything in the lab. We're gonna get a chance to look more into the design of the motor housing later in the presentation, but first I wanna talk about the rover. So where does this rover application come in? As a concept, a Tensegrity structure can be used for low gravity space applications such as rovers. The ability for these structures to deform and store that large amount of potential energy, I mean, conceivably, it's perfect for, for protecting a payload during a heavy and fast impact. So these tensegrity units, they will dampen the load upon impact, and it can protect whatever payload is on board, whether that be you know scientific instruments, humans, or whatnot. Now, this is just an application during landing and impact we can also use the Tensegrity rover to move around whatever environment it is in after the landing sequence. And the picture on the right kind of shows the results of a simulation for a four unit flip maneuver. And you can see that we can press two of the units and then release them and that jumps the rover into the air before landing again. This is what we call a compress and release jump maneuver. And that's the main source of movement and maneuverability for a Tensegrity rover. So a super cool aspect of this project is that we are taking a conceptual idea that's been modeled and simulated and turning it into reality. And this, this project, its aim is to take those models and simulations, the results of them, and to replicate those in the real life physical world. So here in the slide, I got a picture of a small prototype of what we call an eight unit rover. And each of these units, the little circular sphere things, it's only about a foot in diameter, so it's kind of small. The black box in the middle is what we would consider the payload aboard the, aboard the rover. So as I kind of mentioned, um, I'm gonna to refer to things like 
two, four, and eight unit structures, the number, it just corresponds to how many individual units there are that compose each rover. And in general, we're gonna talk about the eight unit structure being the minimum for like a rover design. And that's because you have that space for the payload in the center. However, like the number of units isn't limited to just eight. You can imagine like higher order designs with, you know, 20, 50, or even a hundred units organized in a lattice. So just went through like an overview of the rover design and for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on just a single unit. And that's because like the engineering, it's it's just repeated over and over again. So once we once we engineer our single unit, we just connect them all together to assemble two, four, and eight unit structures. The motion and actuation of each individual unit is defined by one of four different categories. We got passive and active, compression, and release. I'm gonna go into more details on the next few slides, but essentially passive action is not controlled by a motor and it's often categorized by chaos and uncertainty and it happens really quickly. On the other hand, active motion, it's slower, it's controlled. This is done with a motor or a similar mechanism. And thus we have more certainty and control in, in the motion. All righty, let's get into passive and active compression. So passive compression, that's shown on the left is essentially when the unit compresses due to some outside force and then stays compressed. So I've got a person in the video and he's shown compressing the unit with his hand. But in general, like this concept for the rover would involve like you're falling from space and you hit the ground. And upon impact, that unit compresses as, as it absorbs the energy from that impact. And then we want our unit to stay compressed. So that is achieved by like a ratchet mechanism and a constant force spring. So the constant force spring spools up a string that's connected to two sides of that unit. So when it compresses, the constant force spr uh, spring spools up that string and then the ratchet mechanism locks everything in place. Active compression, it's a similar concept. It utilizes the ratchet mechanism and string as before. The difference is that we're not using a constant force spring anymore because it's not strong enough. We actually have a motor that actively winds up the string compressing the unit. And that's, that's shown here on the right. So the speed and amount of compression can be controlled for, for this active compression. And, you know, depending on how much we compress, that can be used as a variable to determine how far we jump and maneuver over a certain difference, a distance. So this is advantageous to pass the compression in the sense that we do have control over how much the unit compresses. Moving on to passive and active release, I'm going to start with passive release. So that's on the left, and it's the uncontrolled release of all that elastic potential energy stored in the bars. And so passive release, we often just call that jumping. So it's achieved by unlocking that ratchet mechanism, enabling the unit to expand back again, releasing that energy, and that results in the jump. As for active release, um, at the current time, we haven't yet engineered like this system to work properly yet. But we are working towards it. So the video is just kind of like it's it's a reversed video of a compression, and it shows what active release would look like. And that's the slow expansion of the unit without any jumping. Uh, an example where you would want to use this is like right after landing. You land, and your passive compression locks everything down but you're actually happy with where you have landed, so you want to stay there. And so you slowly release all that potential energy as to not jump or move out of that place. Now let's take a look at this motor housing that's doing everything. And, you know, the thing that enables all of that compression and release to happen. We'll say there are like three main subsystems that make up the motor housing. The first is the ratchet or latching mechanism. And that provides the ratcheting action as to not allow the unit to release when we don't want it to. In the initial design, a high torque servo actuates back and forth to lock and unlock the ratchet depending on what we want to do. 
we also have our spooling mechanism. So as previously mentioned, there are two ways to spool the unit. The first is the constant force spring, and then also the motor actuation. Both methods, they spin that middle gear, which we call a sun gear, because it kind of looks like the sun, um, and the small string wraps around it compressing. So this initial design uses a servo with a custom gear mounted on top of it to spool up that, that string. And finally, we have our electronic control board that powers and controls all the motors. This was customly designed by one of our team members. Um, and it operates at six volts for the control of those servo motors. And altogether, this motor housing will reside at the top of a Tinsegrity unit mounted with screws to those nodes that I talked about earlier. And then the string would pull up the bottom of the unit to the top to compress it. So here's a video of an early flip test attempt with that first motor housing design. And you know the purpose was to see if the motor housing was working correctly. As you can see, it's not really, like we wanted a full flip. So unfortunately we didn't get that. So we need to figure out how we can go from just a little hop to a full flip. Well, the reason we didn't flip the full time is we didn't have enough energy to do so. So we need to increase that potential energy that's stored in the compressed unit. How do we do that? Increase the bar stiffness. Makes sense, right? So we did that. We just, all we did was added some more carbon bars and making it all stiffer. And as the video shows, this works. We got a flip. That's, uh, super exciting. But, you know, as with all engineering, the work isn't done yet. And there are a number of issues that are kind of under the radar here that need to be addressed before we can attach multiple units together to uh, do some complex jumping maneuvers. So let's talk about these issues that we had. So we did have our successful two unit flip, but we gotta, we gotta do some adjustments. Now I cut out the compression part of that video because it took over 60 seconds for that motor housing to wind up the string and compress the unit. 60 seconds is kind of a long time. We, we want it much faster. And a lot of this slowness has to do with stall torque issues with that servo. And, you know, the battery and servo only operate at six volts. And so in order to fully compress, we actually needed to ensure that the batteries were supercharged and then we'd have to throttle it through and run the servo through its stall torque. And even sometimes with fully charged batteries, it wouldn't compress. So, I mean, we need, we need constant success over and over again. So something needs to change there. Also, when we do flip, um, and I'll just go back to this previous slide here, is you can see that the motor housing ends up on the bottom, on the ground. And so this, you know, when we went when on the ground and you want to compress again, you're basically pulling down from the top. And then when you release, you're going to slam that motor housing into the ground. All that energy is going to go straight to the ground and you're going to have an ineffective flip. So what can we do to solve these two issues? And the next few slides are going to go, kind of go through the solutions that we found. So first to solve that um, with the motor housing ending up on the bottom after a flip, we decided to do what we call biaxial compression. So the idea is what's displayed on the video here. You can see that there's now string coming out of both sides of the motor housing. So this thing is gonna hang out like in the center of those units and it's gonna compress from both sides, the top and bottom. And we have our original hole that's on the left or the bottom. And all we had to do to implement this was drill a hole in the top of the unit and tie a second string to that sun gear. Super important thing to note about this configuration though, is that when we're spooling both strings at once, you're, you're compressing the unit twice as much with a single rotation of the sun gear. And so that actually makes our torque issue even worse. So let's talk about how we addressed that torque issue. So we, we basically solved our torque issue by getting a more powerful motor. Initially, we were using a servo, you know, a continuous rotation, high-speed servo. It did have an encoder, though, which makes programming and controlling it much simpler. 
but these servos, they, they only have a stall torque of like 30 ounce inches when operated at their six volts. On the other hand, our new motor that we chose, it's a 12 volt DC motor with a planetary gearbox attached to it. And that gives it an output, a stall torque of 125 ounce inches. That's, that's four times as much as the servo. And we also have twice the stall current. So this is pretty cool. Um, but this, this new DC motor does require 12 volts of power. So we're going to need to change our motor housing design and our control board design. And a quick thing to note is that there is no built-in encoder. So that is a downside. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the old and new motor housing. And the design, it's, it's pretty similar in general. We've got our sun gear in the middle, the latch mechanism and the spool motor. I mean, then we have a lid that covers everything with the electronics board mounted on top, but the big difference is first are the batteries. The old motor housing, we had three rechargeable batteries that I mean, basically they look like a larger version of those double A batteries that you would put in a TV remote. And they're six volt batteries. So we need something that's 12 volt for our DC motor. We did decide, we decided to go with a LiPo battery and those are commonly used in things like drones and RC helicopters. Additionally, I want to point out that the latch servo used for the ratchet mechanism, it's the same in both the motor housing designs. We didn't change that ratchet mechanism. Also, I didn't point this out before, but I want to note that the spool gear, which is the thing that's attached to that spool motor, it only has teeth on one half. So the reason it only has teeth on one half of the gear is so that when we command the motor to stop spinning, It'll stop with that dead space, and that means the sun gear isn't going to be engaged, and it can spin freely, and that allows us to, you know, release the motor and jump. All right, here's a quick video of our compression test for this new motor housing, and I've hooked it up to a power supply that shows you how much current is being drawn throughout the compression. Notice that at its peak, the motor isn't drawing more than a thousand milliamps of current. And that's less than half of the stall current. So we could definitely increase the stiffness of these bars to get more jumping. And that might be necessary too, because um, this motor housing is a little heavier. All right. Now we're basically in present day. This was kind of taken last week. Um, this video was. And so we're working on getting some flip tests done with our new motor housing. And here's a video of a single unit jump with this motor housing. and on the next slide, I'm going to talk about some issues that we have to address moving forward with the project. And one of them involves this video here. So let's take a look. So I copied the video from the previous slide so we can visualize and look at kind of the main problem that I see in this video. And the main problem is the motor housing jiggle is, is kind of what I call it. And so you'll notice when it jumps, this is the left video. The motor housing moves a lot during the jump. I mean, it's basically just floating in the middle of the unit and it's free to move in whatever way it wants during the chaos that is the jump. So all, a lot of that energy that could be used to propel the unit up as high as possible is lost in the motor housing doing its little dance routine. So we need to come up with a solution that stabilizes the motor housing within the unit so we don't experience that much energy loss. Also quickly, I wanna point out a programming kind of problem that we have to address and that's in the video on the right so when we want to do a four unit flip we need synchronous control of all the units and the in the video we actually send the signal to both units at once but there is a four second delay and you can see that like one jumps first and the other one so it's really ineffective a possible solution to this is to have a singular control board in the center of all units where the battery is and the you know the pcb just and then all we would have is wires running to all the different motors so when with everything centralized that should kind of remove some of this uh synchronous control issues that we're having and also that would save weight because we wouldn't need batteries on each unit all right this concludes the main part of my presentation. I want to take a quick moment to thank the rest of the Tensegrity research team for everyone's hard work in these past few months. Uh, everyone is awesome. And now I'm ready to answer any questions.
Okay, Sam, thank you very much. Uh, there is one question in the chat for you. All right, let me take a quick look. Ah, if one or several of the rover's t tension cables were damaged, could it still operate? Uh, Daryl, no, it would it would fail actually. So the connection of all of the tensile cables is really important. And if one snaps, then the whole integrity of the tensegrity unit fails. Are there other questions to Sam? Uh, seems like no questions. Okay, Sam, thank you very much. So we're done for today. Uh, this is also the last brown bag launch seminar for this semester. And there is a series of brown bag launch seminars for the summer. And uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much, everybody.